G'day, g'day, and we are back today for True Footy Podcast 41 Busher. It has been um, a pretty quiet week or two since our last video. I think I've barely done any videos on this channel, taking a little bit of a step back since uh, the draft period ended. Um, Not much to really cover at this time of year, really. Yeah, I guess so. I kind of um, also wanted to not go too hard too early on draft content because things change pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and I Especially now with the trading picks and stuff on the actual night. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we're going to have like live trades all the way up to it, which makes it really hard to do fandom drafts, which is quite annoying. Uh, so even even predicting that top five at the moment, um, which we'll get into a little bit later, is a battle because we don't know what you know GWS are going to do with the uh, Tom Green pick and, and all that stuff. But uh, first of all, how are you, Busher? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Are you coping all right with no football on TV? Basketball's just come back, so that sort of eased the transition a bit. Are you more basketball than you are footy? In terms of knowledge and that sort of stuff, yeah, I'd say but, probably. But passion? It's a tough one at this point because I've done my years of serious basketball. I've done that mm. stint. Footy is one I've never fully explored properly, so like in terms of playing, so it's a tough mm. one to say. What about you support Fremantle? And you support Fremantle a lot more. I support Fremantle more than any other team I support in anything. Right, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Um, so today we'll... Even though every other team I support and everything else is actually successful. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's the irony of it. As soon as they're successful, yeah. it's going to harder support. I support Liverpool in the Premier League. Um, and uh, I think they've just starved me of success just enough to make me enjoy it. It's sort of like the Eagles, yeah. actually, really. Mm. Just we win a flag like, every now and then. Yeah. So it just keeps it interesting. And Liverpool will hopefully take home their first Premier League this year. But uh, enough about that. We will get into some footy-related stuff. Specifically, Busher, I think we're going to go back today to um, where we let... The questions from the Discord guide, the podcast yeah. at the moment, because um, we have a great Discord community. So thank you for everyone uh, who came in, gave us questions, because oh, we got like ten to fifteen questions here, which is um, yeah, going to take up the whole potty. So yeah. we'll just we'll just roll through them. So since the last episode, Busher, of course, we had the AFL fixtures released for twenty twenty. Yep. Um, and the first question up is from Blitzen03 from the Discord, and. He wants to know our thoughts on our respective clubs' fixtures. So for anyone new to the channel, um, West Coast, your Fremantle, yep. being in Perth. So uh, why don't you take us through how you saw the fixtures? Well, the consensus everyone's saying about Fremantle is we did pretty well, really. Like, a lot of people had us rated the easiest schedule, so I certainly can't complain about our schedule, that's for sure. Yeah, it was quite funny how uh, you were rated the easiest, literally the easiest yeah. fixture for next year, and we were rated the hardest. Of course, that ranking system is not perfect because... Um, I think for a start, it was only based on who you play twice. Mm. Um, and it's also based on how good teams were last year. So next yeah. year, you know, playing Melbourne twice, obviously in 2019 would have been great, but maybe they come back again and they're good. And yeah. if you play them twice, then it's a bummer. So um, it's not a perfect ranking system. And it also, I don't think... Also, I don't think it really, like... Because they say the Eagles have the hardest schedule, but at the same time, they have 11 home games with arguably the biggest home field advantage in football, the Eagles, I'd say. Yeah, arguably. but they also travel far yeah, more than any other team true, as yeah. well. So, but it didn't but so 11 ga- 11, half your games where you're the heavy favourite, basically. Yeah, but we also play 10, or, yeah, 10 genuine away mm. games, which other teams yeah. don't. But still, I'm saying going into a lot of them, you're still probably the better team in a lot of those away games. The fact you're the better team and have that home advantage is... I, I don't know. We feel mitigates some of that issue a bit we've debated this before whether or not it'd be better to be a victorian club playing in 17 games in victoria versus a perth team playing 12 games in perth obviously it's better in victoria yeah okay obviously that's better but not every team can be in victoria realistically so you gotta yeah deal with the cards you dealt to an extent well this ranking system just getting back to the question was from to me and i'm pretty sure it's just based on who you play twice i don't Mm. think it even Factored in who you play home versus who you play away. Uh, so I don't think it was a perfect ranking system. Uh, having said that, of course, the Eagles are going to always have one of the hardest fixtures being they uh, finish in the top six, which yeah. is where you get all the hardest fixtures. And um, yeah, so to answer the question of how I thought about it, I, uh, I do like our fixture, how we have some top teams in Perth this year. Yeah. So we played Brisbane, Geelong and Richmond all away only last year. And this year we play at least Geelong and Richmond in Perth in the opening six rounds. So it's a good chance for us to get a win against them, which obviously is more like an eight-point game. I dislike the travel because the Eagles have two trips to Queensland this year and a trip to Hobart as well, or Launceston. Yeah, that's Um, a bit rough in terms of travel. Yeah, to Queensland seems a bit... Do you think they'd alternate like Mm. each year, like which team you're going up to Queensland to verse, whether it's Gold Coast or Brizzy? 
Yeah, that's right. You shouldn't be away for both of those matchups. Exactly. And certainly not in the same year you go to Tasmania. And it's it's ridiculous how... I mean, we can bang on about it. It's never going to change. And I understand why, but why the teams in like in uh, the teams in Perth, like West Coast and Fremantle, have to travel to Tasmania virtually every year mm-hmm. and Collingwood's never played there. Yeah, that's a bit weird. My thing is still like, if, as long as we only have to travel somewhere once sort of thing, like I'd mm. pop like a yearly trip to Tassie, a yearly trip yeah. to Queensland, a yearly trip to Sydney. But if you had to go versus both New South Wales teams in Sydney, for example, or both mm. Queensland teams, that's ridiculous considering how far away we are from the rest of the country yeah that's true i mean if you wanted to have a little bit more um to ease the burden the perth teams and the adelaide teams should be playing two games in perth and adelaide like against each other every year do you know what i mean so they don't have to travel to queensland twice and tasmania so queensland twice and has once in a year i think that's a bit bullshit thing is i think with that though the adelaide teams would still prefer going to melbourne over here when making Uh, the trip west yeah, fair enough. So they still enough. feel shafted coming here compared to an extra Melbourne game. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I was thinking it more from a Perth perspective, to yeah, be honest. But from you're our right. perspective, yeah. Adelaide's the closest team to us. Yeah, you're right. But I don't want to sound too yeah. salty. I'm not actually too salty about the fixture. I think there was pros and cons to it. It's one know. of those ones, like, every year, like, you have to, like, you can't verse the same team, same time every year. You have to sort of, like, mm-hmm. bounce back and forth sort of thing. So you have to have the years where you're versing the Richmonds and stuff away, yeah. and then the following year it should yeah. balance out as it has. That's right, um, which kind of leads into the next question, uh, which is what West Coast Eagles games are you looking forward to most in 2020? I forgot to write down who asked that question. I think it was Dave, and we'll extend it to Fremantle as well. So did you have any particular Fremantle fixtures that well, you... Well, um... I had the answer to up because I was assuming there's just the Eagles. I was going to say the Derbies. I'm oh, sorry. They're always an easy one, but... It was I take Ws as that question, yeah. sorry. Yeah. But yeah, the two Derbies, obviously. The yeah. closest thing Freo fans get to a finals type environment at the moment fair sort of in terms of competitiveness and drive sort of thing okay fair enough probably some of those big bigger games like some of the bigger teams coming to Perth like they're always good ones to have in terms mm. of us packing our Optus that sort of thing yeah like so the Collingwood game here Carlton they're two of the bigger clubs in terms of popularity yeah that Fremantle Carlton game last year was a belter <laughs> <laughs> don't remind me of that <laughs> fucking game that was fucked nah it was good fun yeah good um, one. for me Geelong and Richmond, as I said, yeah. come into Perth in the opening six rounds. I think they're both night games. That's going to be absolutely spectacular. Randy preview, possibly. Yeah, potentially. Um, and then we play Richmond again at the G later in the year. Um, I'm not looking forward to playing Geelong at GMHBA because I know that's, that's going to go one way. And we play Collingwood both home and away this year. So I, there's a lot of um, top matchups there, really. So, um, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to all of those. Dominic has a question. He's a big Hawthorne fan. And he wants to know our thoughts on uh, West Coast and Hawthorne getting the hardest fixtures. Um, like, like I kind of just said, I think you kind of expect the Eagles to get one of the hardest yeah. fixtures being a top 16, but I, it is funny and how And their Hawthorne, location practically yeah. makes it unavoidable to an extent. Yeah. So Hawthorne were ranked the second hardest fixture. Maybe they are a little bit stiff. Considering where they were in the ladder position, maybe yeah. it's excessive. Mm. But again, like we said, it was just one arbitrary ranking system, which wasn't yeah. perfect. So I don't actually think it'll end up that Hawthorne necessarily and West Coast have necessarily mm. the hardest fixtures. And I think there is the expectation from probably the people who are in charge of the fixture that Hawthorne will improve next year. So they've probably maybe overly reflected that. In Do you reckon that comes into thinking? Uh, well, a little, uh, maybe a little bit in Hawthorne's case and seeing their sustained success. Like Tom, their, Bra- Ra- their Brownlow medalist was out all year. Yeah. They've topped up a bit. Yeah. Clarkson. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm inclined to think more. It was just a bit of bad luck for Hawthorne, if that's the case, the way it's yeah. turned out. I think they've just played some of the harder teams twice. Um, but I think that comes with being a big club. Yeah. You know, the, uh, if you're a Richmond or Collingwood, you're not going to only play each other once a year, no matter where yeah. you finish. Um, same with Carlton. They're always going to play yeah. Richmond twice, pretty much. Always going to play Collingwood and Essendon twice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's definitely some inequities in our league, isn't there? Yeah. It's. Uh, I think some people from other sports looking in would probably look at our like com- the competitive integrity of our league and be like, "This is not quite right." <laughs> the fixture for a start is just mm. messed up. It's a weird one. I, I wouldn't say messed up. It's like it's the practicalities of living in a continent like Australia. Some things, and then like even the chance on who plays who is like. The better teams, you're obviously going to want to get the better teams versing each other. Yeah, but, but um, ideally, so it's financially driven, a lot of mm. the fixturing. 
With Stupid the, well, making you play like four or five teams twice, I'll give you that. That's what I mean. So somebody looks at our fixture and we go, why do you play every team twice and then five arbitrarily picked teams twice? Well, actually not mm. arbitrarily picked. They're picked for financial reasons usually. Yeah. Like I said, so the Collingwoods and Richmonds will play each other twice. Um, no, I think, I think it is an issue, but I do agree that... Um, Logistically and practically, yeah. you know, there's not much. It's you impossible can do. to get it perfect here. Yeah, you'd have to redraw the league completely. Um, you'd have or what, expand the league. My big, I think we're talking about briefly, and the thing was sort of like make it one game each, and then fill that gap of content with like all star game mm. content, that sort of stuff. That's something you could do to make the fixture fairer. Yeah, so everyone so like, plays each other once, and then mm. supplement that with extra football content. Yeah, so like 17 rounds, maybe you play your rival twice, which is, again, yeah. maybe that's not perfect either. But um, financially, that would help a little bit. And then, like you say, like a State of Origin series or something. Yeah. I can't see that ever happening, unfortunately, but yeah. I do like the I do Like, the like even an all-star. Because like, the thing is, if you did a State of Origin, you, like round robin, you only play extra three games, and you've gone mm. down to 17, that brings it to 20 games. You're still down three games for the year. Yeah, see, I, no, I don't want that. As much as I complain about how the fixture's not right, mm. I don't get too... Arc up about it because I don't want a shorter season. Yeah. I think it would. Suck. I think if they timed everything like they planned it all well, like the three bye weeks, just make that a proper bye week and mm. yeah, have the state of origin or an all star game or whatever. Do you think uh, the AFL could ever get to a point where every team plays each other twice? So we're looking at the moment it would be a thirty four game season, potentially thirty eight if we get to twenty teams. That's nearly the whole year. I couldn't see the players agreeing to being around the club mm. pretty much the whole year because you'd have to, you still have to get pre-season in. So mm. 34 weeks, I don't know how... Pre-season's probably 12. That's, that's pretty much a whole year. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, the EPL yeah. goes for 38, yeah. um, 38 weeks, plus they'd have cup matches and stuff like that. Yeah, I, don't, I can't mm. see it with the, uh, the, the physical burden on players and the AFLPA has so much power... Mm. That I can't see it ever happening. Yeah, the thing is, football such a like you get you're getting the shit kicked out of you in football compared to soccer yeah. or basketball. Like mm. basketball, they're playing three, four games a week, like in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, like even the NFL, they only play one game a week strictly because it's a rougher league. Yeah, rougher sport. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't know if that's so. I can't see it getting past well. the one game a week. What you could do is expand the league out potentially and have conferences, which is not ideal, but I, I yeah. could see it going this way and have. You play everyone in your conference yeah. maybe twice. And That's then what the play. NBA does. Is it, how does it work? Do you play the, well, your own conference more times? Than NBA, you play? it's even more weird because there's divisions within the conference. Oh, you really? You play a divisional oh, opponent four mm-hmm. times, I think. Your conference, I think, is four as well. And then into, like the West, East West, you versus the team from the West once to home, once away in the season. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Do you think it's weird that in the AFL we have this weird compromise fixture system where the bottom teams are meant to play and have an easier fixture the following year? Do you think that's weird? It's kind of an inbuilt equalisation measure, mm. but... But on the, a, on the issue yeah. of equalisation, do you think that's a bit of a flaw in the system? To an extent, like, if a team's just decided halfway through the year they don't have a shot and pretty much has written the year off, mm. and then they get a piss-easy schedule the following year because they've had a few bad injuries and written their year off and they're actually a good team. Yeah, and they get be. rewarded for being shitter. Mm. This is come. This actually really comes back to the whole capitalist, like socialist argument, doesn't yeah. it? Where like you give to the poor, yeah. uh, like the top teams that prop up the bottom teams. That is already the case in the yeah. AFL, both financially and mm. um, you know. Yeah, it's a bit of a mixed economy. Like, like even the NBA, they have this thing called the luxury tax. Like the teams that go, over, I don't know how exactly it is in the AFL. It's like teams that go over the cap, they pay a tax to the league, and that's dispersed among yeah. teams that go under. Right. Oh, okay. So that's sort of like how they tax the teams that keep their talent. And, yeah, I mean it's go over it, the cap. It's a sound business strategy equalization because um, even though while I just criticise it, I do think competitiveness is what drives the league and the interest in the yeah. league. So um, contrast it with the EPL where you just say you support Everton. Like, yeah. what's the base ca- best case scenarios for supporting the Everton? You don't get relegated. Sixth. Yeah, that's it. Finishing six. It's pretty much. Any, if you're not one of the big teams in the EPL, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong in saying this. I'm assuming. External guy that doesn't know much about soccer. I'm guessing if you're not one of the Liverpool's man teams, one of those real big sheik back teams sort of thing, yeah. you're pretty much just fighting to not get relegated. Yeah, I mean, maybe not as black and white as that. The some There's the Champions League, you can get your outside chance to yeah. qualify for, and finishing eighth yeah. or seventh or sixth or something gets yeah. you into the Europa League. I forget the exact yeah. qualification, but there is a little bit. Or you can pull a Leicester. Yeah, you can yeah. do a Leicester. But, yeah. uh, but, you know, even that's. 
I don't know. 5,000 or one it was exactly. going into it, I remember, was the bookies. Mind you, Leicester sits currently third on the table. They're doing really well despite sacking the coach. Right. But anyway, uh, we are on a massive tangent. <laughs> yeah. What the hell is the question? We're talking about the competitive integrity yeah. of the league. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, without tearing my, the great game we have apart, um, like the idea of the best teams getting rewarded, sorry, the, the bottom teams getting rewarded and the best teams getting punished for their success. Yeah. It's not, it's not ideal. Like, I know, because they've got the draft lottery in the NBA to prevent teams from just mm. blatantly tanking for the number one pixel thing like it is in the AFL. Yeah. And they've even adjusted that model recently because teams are sort of just writing it off and yeah. taking the 25% chance of the number one pick. But now they've sort of evenly spread out the chance of actually getting that pick. Yeah, yeah. So it disincentivizes teams from tanking. Yeah, fair enough. You I- could sort of put a lottery system in here for that. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know. Like for me, over the last few years, I've kind of gone away from thinking that tanking would be really beneficial for your team. Anyway, I feel like we've seen what happens to clubs that yeah. are bottom out really hard. And then also, yeah. like, look at Fremantle right yeah. now, who's who's bleeding like players yeah. that they really want to keep because they're rebuilding. Yeah. Like I feel like teams have seen in recent years what tanking can how it can yeah. help a club. Because I, I used to be an ad. The clip for tanking, but like that was from my basketball perspective, where it, right. it actually is probably viable because you've only got five guys on the court at once, so that one mm. top pick does make that world of difference. Whereas in footy, there's 22 guys, a lot more is involved. Like even in the NFL, first round picks and stuff are a lot less valued. Yeah. So how would you compare the accuracy and and reliability of recruiting in NBA? Uh, and for those watching, I don't watch NBA. That's why yeah. I'm asking you these questions because I generally don't know. Versus the AFL where I feel like it's getting better, but generally, historically speaking, any pick in the first round is as good as each other. Pick one is never yeah. going to guarantee to be better than pick 20. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's that many resources these days that these basketball guys have. Like They've been watching these kids since they're 13. And they're also older, drafted a bit older, aren't they? 18, 19. Okay, fair enough. I well, thought they were It depends. Like it's like with the States, it's like, if you're born in the States, you have to go to college for a year before you can yes, go to the right. basketball draft. But if you're an international kid, you can just 18 years old, straight in, straight out of high school. Fair enough. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, they've got that many resources, that many people covering it. They're yeah. pretty on top of it, like in terms of knowing who's good. This is a real tangent, yeah. but what do you think about lifting the draft age in the NFL? Ooh, I don't completely shit on the idea because... Mm. Thing is, a lot of these kids usually spend a year or two in the weight room before they're really ready to go. Anyway, yeah, that's true. So maybe a couple more years of having to grind in the waffle system to like make them think, "Is this what I really want?" That sort of thing, rather than just going through school. Yeah, all you're thinking is, "Yeah, I'm going to be an AFL footballer," true. rather than having to play a couple of years, even waffle seniors. Yeah, prove yourself. I think it could be mutual, be- mutually beneficial for both players and clubs. For the player, yeah. like you say, you get that extra year of maturity. Think about this is what you really want to do. Maybe you go to uni or pick up a trade for yeah. a year. Um, and then it's like that article we talked about the other day, how um, some of these kids are getting paid half a million dollars yeah. before they hit their 20s. Um, and then for, but I'm glad that article came out because I always, cause we've had that discussion where I've suspected that's what happens when they mm. give them the early extensions, but it's good to get that confirmation. Yeah, that's right. Because we were sort of speculating, it's like, do they actually get that pay rise immediately? But no, but yeah. The Gold Coast tax, as they were talking about. Yeah. Oh, but sorry, I'll just finish that point. I was just going to say it's beneficial for the club as well because if you get kids a year older, you're probably more likely to, well, you're going to know more info on it. You're going to have more data, more. If he craps out in the year, um, off after or the year before the draft after high school whatever yeah. it is um and he let's say he drops his motivation then you learn yeah. a little bit more about his mental state. so also a thing as well because like i know like my first year is the year i turned 18 like the, when i turned 18 it's like nightclubs sinking mm. pierce having a good time all that stuff so things if you put that draft age back it gives those kids a year or two to get used to going out getting on the pierce having a good time without being in the public spotlight is that like a, a good of, thing or a bad thing, though? Because we could we lose kids to getting addicted. Well, not addicted, but like yeah. throwing themselves into that lifestyle away from a structured club environment. Mm-hmm. We've gone real deep on True Footy Podcast 41. Well, they'd still be playing Waffle, Sandful, VFL. Mm. Or, I don't know how it would work in Vic. Would it be, how old do you, is the tack? Is it purely uh, age you, group? Or? You do get yeah. some overages, yeah. I think. Yeah. But it's it's white Waffle Colts. It's like, yeah, yeah like one year over 18 yeah, or something. Like so like the 19s or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, like, for instance, Hamish Brayshaw for the Eagles was playing yeah. attack as an overager, yeah. yeah. But, 
Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, we just, t- yeah, so we touched on that Gold Coast. They call it Gold Coast tax. Yeah. How uh, Gold Coast have been paying these players that pre draft, apparently, yeah. they're getting a verbal agreement with some players about would they sign an extension to make four hundred. Five hundred thousand dollars a year in their yeah. third and fourth years, and they're getting them to agree to that pre-draft. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll yeah. Just explain that correctly. Yeah. What do you think about that? Because I, well, I can understand why Gold Coast are doing it. Like, I yeah, can, I can see their perspective going. Yeah, we'll give you a bit of extra cash just to get you through the door, and know we've got you through the door for mm. long given two years. Yeah. Something did they say that in the article? Did they mention the article? The length of contracts is something they're considering for draft days. Uh, I can't remember for that in that article, but I've heard that discussed I, before. I think that that's probably the key to it. I think mm. they should just initially make these rookie deals four years. Yeah, or, or even, maybe even three. Three or well, the, I don't mind the NBA rookie structure. Actually, it's the first two years are guaranteed, then the third and fourth years are team options, so okay. the team can choose whether to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, take that player's contract option for that another year, or mm. I which would also always... I think that would also work. Just to bounce off that idea, actually, because if they had that turn in two, like, if the club goes, yeah, we don't want you the third year, that means the kid's just a complete free agent, can do whatever they want, the club's renounced it. Oh, okay. You, you could make it like that, which yeah. is where it would open up stuff more, I think. A complete free agent would be problematic, though, I think. Well, if it's, like, a f- kid that's, like, got his team... But it's a team option, so the kid doesn't have a choice. If oh, the team so he's got, basically delisted then. Yeah, so if the club... Well, then he becomes okay. a free agent anyway. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it, it was a tangent. It's a idea. bit annoying, and it kind of leads to an, the, another question from Michael Stanton, but one second, yeah, I'll, I we'll pause say, the camera before the we run out of time. Close. One moment. Right, and we're back. Sorry, we just had to change the camera. Um, Michael Stanton has asked, what do we think about clubs having to pay the 95% salary cap floor as a minimum? So I think it used to be 92.5%, uh-huh. uh, where you, yeah, you have to pay 92.5% to your club, regardless of how uh-huh. crap you are. And now it's 95%. What do you think about that? I think it's probably part of the collective bargaining agreement, to be honest, because it would be the Players Association going, if a club knows they're staffed, they'll just sign a bunch of cheap guys and ride along until they find someone they want to pay. This way it forces clubs to pay guys. It forces clubs to overpay for spuds. Mm. which is what's happening at Gold Coast. Because there were rumours about this like salary cap issue they had, which I don't know how true that was because they mm. allegedly tried to offer Brad Crouch a million dollars a year yeah. and then offered Ellis 600 thou mm. and lost you know, all those players. But anyway, um, I don't like it. Yeah. I, think, I think you need to give the, cl- the clubs power. Um, the AFL in general is very player, as in the, um, the power uh, balance is well and truly in the hands of the player. Yeah. It's very Australian sort of unionized kind of it's like the attitude of the australian work yeah. workforce is kind of like at Entitled. play here again yeah yeah a little bit yeah. and it's not a bad thing yeah. as an employee who lives in australia yeah. no it's great yeah. but however in the for the sake of the league yeah. um i could also say the employer perspective to an extent for some that's a bit like what do you mean sorry like i've forced an employee employers in the situations that mm. reflect affect their bottom lines and stuff to do mm. these things and compensate people. Are you just talking about business in general? Or business AFL? in general, yeah. yeah or probably right. even AFL to an extent. Like Gold Coast wouldn't mm. be a profitable operation. But the yeah. thing is, none of the none of the teams are privately owned in AFL. Are they? It's so owned not. by football commission, run by football commissions. Yeah, that's something that I'd be interested potentially say in AFL's private ownership of clubs. Yeah. Okay. That that's sort of something that drives a lot of things in other leagues and stuff. What do you think would change? Well, it'd probably be. Probably more com- be a bit more commercial, obviously, but like mm. that's not necessarily a bad thing because it's trying to get more engagement. Because business, they're motivated by getting people involved, profit people engaging with the game, so they'd be working hard to increase their profits, which is participation in football, basically. Yeah, it's basically how you measure the profits of a sporting organization. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know really how, know how that would look like. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, it'd be a lot of tweaking. It'd be a long way down the road, but I think it's something they should consider. Yeah, I don't know if it would ever happen. I don't know, mm. but yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, but to answer Michael's question, I, I think it's a bit silly. I, I would be fine with them dropping it back to ninety percent. You just give the mm. you give these players like Gold Coast time to actually, you know, makes get some salary cap room and actually be able to offer the a thing is, contract. To like we mentioned though, the thing is they've not give. Like they're not necessarily giving the excess money to spuds; they're giving it to speculate on kids. That's mm. what that article talking about was hinting at. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, like that Aiden Bonner from GWS. Yeah. That was a strange one. Yeah, where even though he's a very talented kid, yeah. like they were sort of looking at GWS when they draft him, it's like this kid's not necessarily going to be getting a game mm. anytime soon. So why offer him four hundred thousand dollars a year? Exactly, it's a bit. It's ridiculous. Mm. It just that's really poor management. Uh, I don't know. And they traded him for nothing. They got literally nothing out of it. Uh, and GWS were cap cash strapped when they drafted him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a yeah. head fuck to be honest. Back loaded, front loaded. That's the thing. They've shuffled the money around to different years. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, okay, so moving on to with some draft questions. Dominic has come back with the next question, and he says, "Which team needs to a uh, most needs to nail the draft?" So every team wants to nail the draft, but which play? Well, I guess which teams um, are in a bit more of a precarious state, and this draft is really important for them. Do you have any Melbourne? I think because they've yeah they've leveraged heavily into this draft at the expense of future drafts. So they've okay. decided this is they've sort of signified that this is the draft that we're going to top up and get back to where we were two years ago. Mm-hmm. So they really need to hit the right players that can complement what they've got and get them back to that top four where they were a couple of seasons ago. That's an interesting And they've point. got the potential to do it. Yes. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. I, uh, I look at Melbourne's list and I think it, I don't necessarily think they need two top ten picks. You know what I mean? Like I look yeah. at other teams' lists yeah. without talent. Melbourne has talent. However, you make a good point. They've bought heavily into the top ten of this draft. Yeah. And if they mess it up, then they're going to look like absolute yeah. idiots. So. And it could affect them for years to come because they're, they're the crossroads I'd say mm. where they could either get back to where they were or continue being the Melbourne we've historically known in the past yeah my entire life yeah fair enough that's right um, I'm going to throw up another suggestion Adelaide yeah. because they've had the exodus there's been talk about how you know I, I've gone on about it I'm they're probably sick of hearing me saying this but um, just the fact that they really need an injection of youth they've got like five picks in the top 45 or six picks in the top 45 this year it is important that they nail this draft to set up their next generation. I'm going to say Fremantle as well. Yeah. You think so? I wouldn't have said that before they started losing all these players because mm. you've had a good run drafting um, fairly good talent, I would say. Yeah. But if, uh, if you're going to keep losing established players, then you need, this draft becomes important again. You probably haven't finished your rebuild with someone mm. like Brad Hill walking the other way. Yeah, that's put it like... I've quite pessimistic in terms of next year, I've got to say, unfortunately, mm. even if we nail the draft, get two great kids, I think I don't think they're gonna help us too much next year. Yeah, that's right. And I feel the only like thing that could help us is if we get a real good healthy year and our spine holds mm. up really well, Longmuir figures out how to get him involved more than they were previously. Yeah. Well the forward half spine at least. I our key backs were plenty involved. Yeah. I could see uh, another up and down year for free. I don't think they'll get worse. I don't think if they're in a terrible state. But the the way the list composition is moving now, it's like with all these draft picks coming in, established players going the other way. the The window for them to win a flag while fives in his peak is that's just the problem. diminishing. That's the problem. Really that's my diminishing. big problem. Like if they keep going to the draft every year, yeah, let's keep rebuilding. Mm. Uh, by the time we've got enough talent around those guys, Fife's going to be in bloody crutches and Walters is going to be right next to him at the retirement home. I mean, I don't think Fremantle are doing it by choice. Fremantle, Obviously not. Fremantle choice. are bleeding players and to be fair to them, they've extracted a lot of value for those trades. But yeah, I can't. Yeah, we've traded well and stuff, but still I'm... I know what you mean. Yeah, it's, yeah. If it's just year after year pinging our hopes on some 18-year-old kid... Mm. What's the point? Yeah, for me, honestly. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally know what you mean. Uh, Hawthorne was another team I was going to suggest. Now, I don't think they're in a bad state or anything like that. However, this is their first or their highest pick since 2006. I'm reliably informed. So, 13 years since they had a pick this high. I think I think they really want to nail it, to be honest. And their Premiership dynasty was more or less built on an amazing draft in like 04, 05. They yeah, got Ruffhead, that... Franklin, uh, they got Sam Mitchell, Luke Hodge in 01. Um, they did draft yeah. really well and built that ne- that premiership last year. Sorry, like their, sorry, that last premiership dynasty, I mean to say. So um, I think they need a balance of trading in players like they have, but I think they'd really love to nail the first round pick. It's been a while. Yeah, definitely. I'd like to see them just commit and take one. Mm. Gross. Because literally every year, it's some they're the because they're the destination club. Every year, they've got to give up their pick to bring in whoever that year's gone. Yeah, I'm going to Hawthorne. Yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of yeah, leads... they've somehow come up with another spare million bucks. Yeah, go on, I'll go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, well, that kind of leads us into a nice segue. Dominic has another question, and he says, uh, "What are your thoughts on Hawthorne? If they can get, uh, and if they can get Finn McGuinness at pick thirty or forty-two, and both 40... <laughs> I messed up this, the actual question. 
getting Finn McGuinness for pick 30 or 42, so he's a father-son yeah. or both, um, and a top 10 player with pick 11. Um, and also, how do you think they'll sit next year with a fully fit team? Sorry, I butchered that question. <laughs> to answer the question, to make it a bit simpler, um, I think they will be able to take Finn McGuinness using 30 and 42. I'm not sure the exact points on that, but I, mm. I think they'll keep pick Depends 11. Depends when the bid comes, obviously. Yeah, they'll keep pick 11. They'll be able to take a good play yeah. there. I've got a couple of ideas in mind. Um, uh, Michael made a few good suggestions in the Discord. Brody Kemp, I can really see. I've heard that Fisher Mackesy or whatever his name Mac- linked Mackesy, to them. Mackesy, yeah, he um. Is every time I watch, Mackesy? I don't know. Every time I see Cal Toomey saying Fisher Mackesy to Hawthorne, oh, is, is he say it like that? Because I've only ever I seen it written down. I've never. Yeah, I think he said Mackesy. Mackesy, that's. Yeah. I've been saying that's how Mac- I've heard Mackesy. Yeah. Wow, I look like a real nuffy now. <laughs> um, yeah, see, that's this is an interesting battle with um, Hawthorne here. They need key position talent, yeah. particularly KPD, on their list. And Fisher Mackesy, see, I know his name, uh, is the best available talent yeah. and he's right in that draft range. But yeah. I can just see Hawthorne going, nah, we're going to take the best available player. Yeah. And that makes me think Devin Robertson, Dylan You Stevens, reckon Robertson still uh, there? If he's still at their 11. Freo's yeah, taken him with 10 if Henry hasn't been bid on, surely, if we haven't taken him with 7. I don't know, man. I don't, th- I don't think Fremantle also, similarly to Hawthorne, they're not the type to just take who, who you think they will, in my opinion. Yeah. But I, Dylan, I, Devin Robertson's... Probably best available at 10, I'd say. Yeah, but if, if Devin Robinson's at 10 and Freo don't take him, unless the player they take instead pans out good, there'll be a lot of pissed off Fremantle fans, I reckon. There's a, there's if a, he falls to 10 and they don't take him. It's, just, it's so subjective. He, mm. We're talking one pick behind, yeah. like pick 10 or 11. Yeah. Devin Robinson has been... But 10's the bottom of his range. I don't know. I, d- I, that's, I disagree. I've had some people say late first round. I don't think he'll go that late. But I Every time I hear Twomey, he's saying Sydney are considering him, Melbourne are considering him. So yeah, mate. May, well, Melbourne maybe with pick eight. Yeah. Sydney, that's, a, that's the earliest I've ever seen it. Yeah. But look, I'm, I won't argue about where Robertson's going to go. I just don't think 11 is out of his range. Mm. I, yeah, but anyway, <laughs> Brody Kemp, Dylan Stevens, Mackesy, they could all... They could all end up there. I, I could see them taking Stevens. He's an electric outside sort of wingman. I love watching him play. Um, I, I feel like he'd do really well in that Hawthorne lineup. He's like a, he's he's like as quick as Wingard almost. Mm. Probably not quite that quick, but you know, I could just see with his with his good skills as well. Uh. Them turning into a, him into like a first year gun. Yeah. But where do you think Hawthorne will finish next year with a fully fit team? I think I've had, I've said this in the past, but I think they'll play finals. Yeah, they'll get in the bottom half of the eight, maybe. Probably, it's hard to say, but yeah, it's, I'm more likely to put him in than out. Yeah, gross. <laughs> um, next draft question is Michael Stanton again. Um, he's asking, do you think GWS will move up the order to get a pick before a bid for Green comes? So Tom Green is their academy player. Looks like an absolute yeah. jet. Um, what are your thoughts on that? That would be their ideal scenario, but it obviously depends how much they're giving up to get maybe that Melbourne pick three, that Adelaide pick four. Because yeah. they've got six at the moment, so it would be six and something else to get to that position. I don't know how they're going to get it done. I presume they're – well, I, I think it, I'm very confident they're going to do this for a particular play, like they've got someone in mind. Yeah. I doubt they're, they're coming in with this deliberate strategy and be like, oh, we just want another top five talent. In my opinion, they're looking at a specific player – my guess would be that's probably Luke Jackson mm. because of their need yeah, for right, a ruck. Yeah. He's been talked about. He's been linked with Melbourne's pick three lately. Yeah. We'll see what happens there. That's obviously the earlier end of his, um, his range. But like you said, I don't see how they get it done. They have picks 6, 40, and 59. So I don't know what future they can Future something. They can offer a future first. So like six and a future first for three. But that's, that's it, massively steep. Reckon future second and six... To do it? Sure. But then in that instance, doesn't that leave them without enough points for Tom Green? Because then the next pick is after, is 40. Can't they go... I'd, I'm not sure exactly. Because they can go into a deficit, I think. But how much of a deficit is the They issue? can, yeah. That, but I don't know how much. Yeah. But if the next pick is pick 40, they won't be able to match it. Maybe some people yeah. can answer this better than myself. Yeah. But I think I had potentially six in a future first for Adelaide's four and 23. But is that uh, enough points? 23 and 40 to match for green. Uh, I don't think that's enough. Uh, and Adelaide probably don't get a great deal out of that because then you're delaying their rebuild because uh, they want they want to hold on to pick four or at least uh, be present in this year's first round. Uh, I don't see how it gets done. And I, I think I read as well Melbourne pretty much saying pick three is off limits. They must, have, they must have their eyes on someone. Well, the talk is Luke Jackson. Yeah. So. That's ridiculous. 
for Melbourne. It is ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Max Gorn, Bruce. Yeah. But, Still, but, you could play Jackson forward, back. Yeah. But don't forget, Jackson's probably not going to be hitting his peak for another six years. Mm. So, yeah. they, they're probably looking more at the contingency plan. But they must just look at him and think, yes, that is the next Premier Ruckman at the competition. Yeah. That's the only reason I could justify He has that it. potential. I, I, the thing is, He's I could so see short. recruiters absolutely swooning over him. Mm. He's very short, though. 199. Yeah, that's quite short for a ruck. It's not too bad. Like, it's definitely on the shorter side, but with his athleticism we're, and strength, he'd sort of... 199, that. I reckon you can do a second ruck. You can be a second ruck, but to be a, one of the premier rucks in the competition, I reckon he needs to grow to 202 plus. What's Grundy about? 204, maybe even taller. I think he was drafted at 20, well, maybe 203. Uh-huh. Um, Nick Nat's a short ruckman, but he's 201. He's, I thought he was 203, Nick. Nah, he's 201. Uh-huh. Uh, he's athletic as hell. Uh-huh. So is Luke Jackson. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. But he's also shorter. Mm. But maybe Luke Jackson grows. Who knows? Mm. That's just my opinion. Okay. Um, yeah, so to answer the question, I don't know how the GWS are going to get it done. I, I'm going to guess that they're not going to get a trade done. Yeah, it's hard to say how. Yeah. So I think they'll bid on him with pick six. I think the bid will probably come at about three or four. Probably four. Mm. I reckon Adelaide will yeah. probably bid on him. And then they'll match it. And then I guess they get their six shuffled down to... Okay. Like a second round. I don't know exactly how it works, but... Something um, weird. Yeah, because they... Pick six would be too much on its own in points because they get a 25% discount. Uh, so they'd get a pick in return. Uh, um, okay, Michael's asking... Well, we are pumping the Michael Stanton questions because a lot of them are draft-related, but there are other questions, guys. Um, <laughs> he's asking, do you have a player that isn't considered a first-round prospect as such, but you like the look of? Probably some of these WA kids for the probably... A part of the championship team, but not your Devin mm. Robertson, Luke Jackson, Liam Henry mm. level names like your Riverses, your yeah. I think Rivers Jeremy could, Sharps. I have Jeremy Sharp written down. Yeah. I thought I knew we'd both say WA because yeah. like we just it's yeah. our natural tendency to look at the WA yeah. kids first uh, yeah. in the draft. Jeremy Sharp's one I really like. I yeah. think Rivers will go for me. The East Freo in particular, <laughs> true, <laughs> true, Sharp. But I've been watching or being paying paying attention to Jeremy Sharp for a while now. Um, He's a bit. Of, he's a defender, sort of outside mid yeah. as well. Um, some people have compared him to crack, Jack yeah. to crack risk. <laughs> no, Jack Crisp. Um, I don't know. I like him outside of yeah. the. the uh, like I must admit, my, there's a bit of a gap in my draft research this year. I'm looking at the first round, and then I'm looking at pick 46, which is West Coast. <laughs> so like, yeah. there's a bit of a gap there. Um, but I would say Jeremy Sharp is one player that I really yeah. quite like watching. So yeah. Right. yeah. Michael Stanton again asks, <laughs> who do you think will be the best player from the draft? Um, and he says, besides Rao. Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. I'll go the tangent. I'll, I'll say Luke Jackson figures it out. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I'll back in the fellow basketball, even though he's a lot better at it than I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be so humble. Um, <laughs> for me, the obvious answers are Anderson and then Tom Green as well. Yeah, Jackson's Green, a good nomination. Yeah. But um, I'm going to say... Um, I'll just give a few other nominations. Caleb Sarong, I think, is a real gun. However, he is a short ass. He's only 179 centimetres. Uh, you tend to discriminate a little bit against height in the draft or against lack of height in the draft. Yeah. Will he ever become... Will he be actually become the best player in the draft? Mind you, actually, now that I say that, I'm just thinking Rao's a short ass as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But anyway... Rao's like 180... He's six foot, Rao. He's is he? 183, ain't he? I thought he was a bit shorter than that, actually. Fair enough. You'd... I thought he was closer to 180. Oh, fair enough. But Sarong, I don't know. I think Sarong just moves like a, he's just an absolute gun, like really skillful footballer. Yeah. I can see him being a bargain. I think he could slide it out of the top five now. And whoever gets him, mm. potentially Fremantle, um, I think they're going to get a bargain there. Lockie Ash is another one I really like watching. Really fast, really skillful. Kind of reminds me a bit of Lockie Whitfield. Obviously, you know, you bank, bank on him not being as good as Whitfield. But if he puts it together like Whitfield, he could be the best player in the draft. And then another injury-prone player who did an ACL, Brody Kemp, uh, big oversized midfielder as well. So it's it's kind of our way when we look at an oversized midfielder in the draft. Go, the he could be the, the best player. Yeah, like, <laughs> who's the flavour of the month? We'll go. Yeah, there. so that's why we said Anderson, Green, yeah. and Kemp um, <laughs> as three of our well, three yeah. of my favourite um, plays in this draft. So yeah, I hope that yeah. that was a fair answer to the question. Stanton is back again with the next question. He did send in a heap of questions. I tried to mix up the order, but um, here we go. 
The AFL has announced that there's no rule changes for 2020 despite scores plummeting to their lowest point in 50 years. I didn't actually realise that. Their yeah, lowest point that in 50 bad, yeah. years. That's incredible. Do you think this is the right move? And if not, what rule should they introduce? I'm kind of happy they haven't changed the rules because honestly, with the points being the lowest they have been in 50 years, it's because the coaches have to figure out how to navigate these new rules every bloody year. Give them a few years with the same set of rules so they can go, where they're like really sitting there thinking about it because it's their jobs, obviously. They, f- they can figure out ways around it, how to... Mm work with the rules I've got. That's the point of a game. You've got your set of rules and you've got to figure out how to navigate those rules as best you can. Yep, that's very true. So you've got to stick... You can't change the rule book every year. I think I read... It's gotten a bit ridiculous for me. Was it Brad Scott, I think, early in the year, I think I even said it on this podcast, said that partially he reckoned the lowest scoring was because of the conservatism by the coaches under the new rules. So they're playing Mm. less risky football, trying to size each other up a little bit more um, because of the, the... the propensity to get scored against quickly, I guess. Yeah. So there's a lot of defensive football, a lot of uncontested marks, passing sideways and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that plays into your point how, like, the coaching has influenced the scoring probably more than the rules have. I quite like the rules in hindsight, the ones that were brought in last Yeah, I, I'm not shitting on the current rules I brought in, but I'm just saying yeah. you have to... At you a have point, to let them just, settle. You have to let the rules settle at a point, let yeah. people go, yeah, this is what's going on. I agree. You can't... Every year they keep moving the line... Like I think 666 six, six yeah. is a good rule in hindsight. It's mm. not a dramatic change, despite yeah. it being people probably overplayed how big a mm. rule it is. But I think when they first announced it, people assumed it was going to be more like netball. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. exactly right. Um, well, that's what the, there's a little theory about Gill and the AFL and their PR, which I think yeah. is really clever if it's true. And what they do is they, they leak out rumours of or, bad, shit of and bad changes and then the changes that actually make it a lot more conservative and people are like, oh, yeah, I can live with that and that, yeah. that worked on me. Mm. Um, this night grand final shit apparently was yeah. um, a bit of a bit of a ruse. I really hope that doesn't happen but let's not talk about that mm. now. Um, the 666 and the deeper kick-ins. My issue with the deeper kick-in, oh, sorry, as in, um, you know, where you, you have You to, can run out of the square. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So you kick from further in. I was worried about the aesthetic of that. I thought it would look weird, but I'm used to it now. Yeah. I, th- I think it works well. So, yeah. um, to answer the question as well, oh, last point is I was going to say, I don't think higher scoring is more entertaining football for me. I'm, I'm more interested in a competitive game. Yeah, me too. The teams are close, going hard at the pill, putting on a good game. The contested side of football is more interesting to me. I like seeing. I do enjoy nice. Play. Yeah, I do like seeing a classy team just kick, 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 bang. Yep, that's pretty impressive. Like the efficiency and skill to execute those consecutive field kicks. But if that happens more often during the game, then the value of it goes down. So you mm. enjoy it less. Yeah, I don't know. Same. It's like it's yeah. like in twenty twenty, right? In cricket, yeah. everyone's like, "Oh, more boundaries. That'll make it more interesting." Yeah, but if it's so balanced in the way yeah. of the batting side that where boundaries are getting hit every over, yeah. every couple of balls, then the the value of the boundary decreases, and yeah. then we just see run fest, which is why I've disliked one day cricket in recent years. But yeah. that is a massive tangent. I've just gone on. <laughs> Michael then does have one more question. It's probably not his last one, actually. And it, <laughs> he's asking for what do you think about preseason or midseason trade periods? It's one of those ones. It's like, I've because I've come uh, for the tenth time I've mentioned. So I've got the basketball background where there's the more free trade of players, where there's mm-hmm. you can trade during the season. I think it could be something that they should consider, like because a team like, for example, like Eagles, Nick Nat goes down, your mm. ruck depth for that point is virtually non-existent. Mm. So in the mid-season trade and draft period, you could target maybe Braden Pruce or something because he's stuck at Melbourne for another year because he was stupid enough to sign there instead of a team where he would have got a game. That was weird, wasn't it, in yeah. hindsight? Even at, not even in hindsight, just in general, <laughs> Pruce recording yeah. a trade in Melbourne was ridiculous. Do you yeah. think that's a good thing, though? Did, would you like to see that? I'd, like, I wouldn't mind saying that. Like, if, cause if one injuries cost your team the chance to win a flag... Then it should be... That's on the team, in my opinion. Mm, I so guess, the, yeah, that's, that's list what, management, but... That, in my opinion, the, the fun of list management is that you prepare your squad of 44 players or whatever it is. Yeah, I think it's 44 still. 44, then some expanded rookie. Yeah, exactly yeah, right. Jazz. You prepare it, and that is your squad for the Premier League assault. If you have a good key player and go down, and you don't have the depth, then that's your fault. I, I like that, but at yeah. the same time, it's like... It's yeah. good for, like... Because maybe the team trading you, Braden Proust, needed a midfielder and... Hamish Brayshaw gets the chance to go and play with Angus because he's brought depth mm. and not getting a game. That's an example. I'm not necessarily saying Hamish should get a game at Melbourne, but yeah, you'd get my point. Could we see uh, an interesting scenario? Would be if a bottom team has a really good player. Um, 
Oh, okay, let's say Geelong were bottom six this year, right? And Tim mm. Kelly wanted to go home and it was the worst kept secret. We had a mid-season trade period. Mm. What, we, what we could see is the Eagles, who were, let's say, top four, yeah. um, going, hey, we could really add Tim Kelly to our squad to win the flag this year. They, pay, they would probably pay an absolute premium to get mm. it mid-season. They already did pay yeah. an absolute premium, but let's say in this hypothetical yeah. they paid 25% more. That would be mm. an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Like, even you're sort of seeing it, like, in AFL circles, as, like, this is one that happens in basketball as well, with a player a year out from when their contract finishes saying mm. when they want to, like, a year before their contract finishes saying, I want to go, trade me now so you can get something for me. That's yeah. become more prevalent in both sports. Mm. I think the mid-season period would open that sort of discussion up a bit more. Yeah. Where if people are willing to be mature about the fact the person's leaving, you can maximise their worth, give yeah. them more opportunities to capitalise. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't actually really care for it, to be honest. The, mm. I, I like having this dedicated period where players can move. I guess, uh, I guess a pre-season one would make it a little bit interesting. I still think the main ones would get done at the end of the year. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm sort of not, not saying make it a constant throughout the year, like a window, like make it a yeah. window, like the bye yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Mm. Make it a limited window. Yeah. What did you think of the mid-season draft? I thought it was largely pointless. Yeah, certainly, like... A few few players have established themselves as a consequence of it. Like Noble got an extension with Collingwood. Mm, Pickett obviously signed an extension with Richmond. Yeah, I guess. What about Carlton picking up DeLuca? We talked about this in the chat, and I just yeah. think, why did Carlton bother? They picked him up for six months. He performed exactly like you'd expect him to play. He's a mature waffle player. He's proven. He played to the talent that they expected him to play and they delisted him. It's just utterly pointless. Depth yeah, was purely... Did Carlton really need to add mature depth thing is in if, the second half of the year? thing is, if the AFL is going to give you the opportunity to take a player for free and you've mm. got someone... That's uh, because if someone's injured, you can take someone in the mid-season. True. So if you've got someone injured for the year anyway and the AFL's going, you have a free crack at some half-decent player for six months in case you need him, you're not going to say no. I suppose. I just maybe they could have picked someone a bit more speculative, a bit more high ceiling. Mm. The Luca had already played. Yes. AFL. Well, considering there was such a shit position on the ladder, maybe it was worth using as a chance to speculate on. Yeah. Someone, but I suppose it was a free swing. I just maybe would have thought they'd be a bit more intentional with it. I just, yeah. just thought it was a bit of a low percentage mm. recruit, and oh, then did, to list him after six months as well. Yeah. I was going to say as well. Did you see Silvani left Carlton today? Which still Stephen. Stephen. Oh no, I yeah. didn't see that actually. He, it hasn't been getting along well with the new CEO, apparently, I was reading. So, yeah, he's left Carlton, Steve. I wonder if it's because of his horrible recruiting over the last Probably. five years or however long yeah. he's been at Carlton. Yeah. All those ex-GWS rejects. Did yeah. any of them come good? I don't think so. Not for Carlton. No, no, <laughs> None I don't of think Carlton's did. any of them have become decent players. Yeah. I'm trying. Oh, um, Plowman. Yeah, he's Plowman's a pretty good player. March, oh, March, March, March Okay, yeah. all right. March Mag- Plowman, yeah. Yeah, but I guess those were top ten. No, yeah. you know. no you're right. No, credit to him. Those were good picks. Hmm. But then yeah. a lot of them were duddery. Absolute duddery. And there was Pickett and... Well, they got delisted. Yeah. He, Pickett's delisted now. Yeah, who else? What you... They had a few, yeah, few dubs. Oh, there. Mark Wiley. Phillips. Yeah. Phillips yeah, now Phil- at Essendon, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Tangent. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of the delisted free agent signings so far? So... Uh, Sam Gray. Sam Gray, Caden Brand both signed with Sydney. Yeah. Noon signed with Carlton. Wiley Buzzer is now at Port Adelaide. Hard to comment on Buzz. I don't really yeah. know too much about him. I just know he's got an amazing I've heard name. raps about him, yeah. I've heard like people like him, but I'm not sure if it's because he's catchy name or because he's a future star sort of thing. It's yeah. To say with him. The brand thing was interesting because Hawthorne need key position depth at the back yeah. and he's a key defender. Yeah. Obviously, they didn't rate him. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see he snapped up, though, if they've let him go and yeah. in a position of need. Yeah, and Sydney, Sydney are really good at picking these... Um, like what's rejects, the word? yeah, rejects and <laughs> recycling them into good players, yeah. and I think Sam Gray will do well there. I, I was surprised they got rid of Sam Gray, especially because it sounds like Rosie wants to push more for a midfield role. My impression is that Sam Gray wanted to leave and they couldn't get a deal done, uh-huh. um, and then they thought, oh, well, oh, still is actually, I was reading that Paul only offered him one year and he wanted two or something. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, yeah. then they obviously just want to push on with this yeah. rebuild and don't see him in part of their future. But yeah, yeah no. Nah, I... Somebody asks what it, what was the worst delisting? Ooh. Somebody asked that. I where did I write my answer? Yeah, that's a tough one off the top of my head. Uh Duck slash HK Pig. What do you think yeah. was the worst delisting? Sam Gray. The other two I was gonna put were Nick Robertson. Mm. I, when I say worst delisting, it's not really a big surprise. However, I do think he will he has something to offer at AFL level still. Do you think anyone picks him up? GWS was linked to him. 
Yeah. I think he could be a good fit at Fremantle as depth, mm. not best 22 necessarily. Mm. I would take him at West Coast. I don't think they yeah. will because of the salary cap and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think he, I would take him talent-wise. Yeah. And uh, like I said, Josh DeLuca, I just thought it was a bit of a... I don't think his Carlton owes him more than one year or six yeah. months, DeLuca. I just I just don't know. I just thought it was a weird strategy. But anyway. Yeah. Um, Michael's asking, will there be any live coverage of the draft from you guys? Yes, we were talking about it earlier. You're going to be in Bali. Yeah, we were originally planning the live stream, the both of us, but I found, I've looked at the timing. I fly out the day of the draft, actually. Mm. Yeah, and you have a court appearance the second day. Yep, I'm straight to Bali court. <laughs> yeah. I'm fly-kicking people on scooters, all sorts of shit like that. Yeah, that's a euphemism. Actually, uh, if I had to go back to ba- Indonesia for a court case, I wouldn't. Because I, I, <laughs> I ain't fucking with no Balinese joke. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of logical flaws in our joke. But <laughs> um, anyway... I will be doing a live stream maybe by myself. I would recruit someone, but I don't know anyone like in our friendship circle that follows the draft as much as I do. Yeah. And Joyce is in Bunbury and it's a weekday. He's not yeah. going to get up. Um, so we'll see. At this stage, it's just yeah. me. So I'll probably live stream both days. Yeah. I've got the days booked off work. Nice. Um, Bangers, GWS fan asks, is there any situation where you'd call GWS pick swap a smart decision? Now, this is interesting. So they traded 6 and 59. Or they got in 6 and 59. Mm-hmm. From the Saints and gave away 12 and 18. It is a bit pointless, I thought, because they actually have less points in this scenario. And yeah, and they probably could have used one of those two picks to cover the inevitable bid yeah. on grain. They, especially because I think they're thinking six would be before the bid. But That's what I'm thinking too. Now it looks like it's less likely that it's going to be before the bid, so now it's looking a bit more dubious because they could have probably just used 12 and changed to cover the bid and still had 18, yeah. something like that. Yeah, I, I'm, th- I'm thinking along the same lines, to be honest. I, mm. That's the only way I can justify it because, yeah, yeah. they're not in a great position. <laughs> yeah, they... I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something obvious, but when I read through that question I looked into it, I was like, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what you when said. The, when the f- trade first went down, everyone's like, yeah, they're trying to get ahead of a green bid. Yeah. Except now it looks like it's coming before six anyway. Yeah, so... No, I, don't, I think that might be a fuck-up unless they somehow do get pick three or four yeah. and then get pick six as well. I don't know. Yeah. It's all a bit iffy. Um, Next minute, they don't match on Tom Green and just take someone else anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have I missed any questions? No, I think we're good. I think we're good. So next question is, uh, thoughts on GWS getting 19 picks in their first three seasons? Gold Coast got 10 and Fremantle got four. This is from Bruce. Yeah. He says, is it, it's unfair that GWS got an advantage Oh, is it unfair that GWS get an advantage or is it a fair experiment and the AFL also make the right call in the location of these expansion teams? So let's just look at the draft picks question first. Okay. What do you think? Like, do you think it's unfair? Like, what, It's what one of those ones that do need to be more balanced when they bring in these expansion teams. But the thing is, when they bring in these expansion teams, it's not exactly planned. It's sort of like something that's mm. long-term being considered. They go, yeah, we'll mm. put a team here. So, and then circumstances change in the time. Like in the 20 or so years between Fremantle and Gold Coast, it's birthings. Mm. Terrible well, word. The drafts, <laughs> Berthman. It's Berthman. actually the word. No, um, <laughs> there's been a huge time time lapse. The draft structure and what the draft is as a product now yeah. is so different to what it was when Fremantle started. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely unfair, of course. Mm. They've they've both been given a leg up, uh, way more than Fremantle, even yeah. Port Adelaide. But look at Port Adelaide. They want to flag within seven years. Because I, I was going to chime in though. I will say Freo shat the bed with their early, yes. yeah. early. Well, look at the difference between Gold Coast yeah. and GWS. Mm. Exactly. And I know GWS definitely got more of a leg up yeah. than Gold Coast, but there's been obvious obvious gulf in the mismanagement mm. between those two clubs. Yeah. But yeah, Freo was a lot closer to a Gold Coast than a GWS, I'd say, in terms of management early days. Sure, but they weren't that bad. They've only won yeah. one spoon. Yeah. Might use GW. Uh, sorry, Gold Coast have only won two. Yeah. So it's not the best metric, but yeah, yeah, you're right. Gold Coast have just been an absolute disaster. Yeah. But to answer the question, is it unfair? Absolutely, it's unfair. Certainly. From a business perspective, they've got one right and one wrong. Yeah. Gold Coast and GWS. I don't think I don't have any issue with the location of it though. Yeah, I couldn't think of any. Tassie, maybe like in hindsight, sure. but yeah. But uh, but Tasmania's crowd numbers are consistently about what GWS and Gold Coast get. Yeah, I don't think there's a big gulf. If I'm, correct mm. me if I'm wrong, but I've looked at them before. It, was it makes size, sense but. from the point where they're trying to crack into those mm. markets. I just think maybe they're more optimistic about succeeding than I'm mm. optimistic for their success. Yeah. Because <laughs> I know how entrenched NRL yeah. is in the eastern states. 
I, I, I do want to make the point that I really don't think the fact that it's in Gold, Gold Coast is any issue related to them being shit, which I feel mm. like some people miss the point of. They say yeah. that, oh, they shouldn't have started in Gold Coast. It was a way to time. It's unrelated. Mm. It was just poorly managed. Well, they had shit facilities up there in the early... Sure. They were, they were playing out at the Mountables for like the first mm. four or five years. Yeah. That's true. If, I'd roll, if I was some kid, 18-year-old kid, high draft pick, thinking, oh, I'm going to the AFL, my dreams are come true, roll up first day of work, yeah, you come in the demountable like it's yeah. period four sos. Yeah. Fucking, <laughs> period four you'd so. be a bit deflated. <laughs> no wonder that to pay him 500 grand. That takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, which is a really strong argument against putting a, a team somewhere regional like Mandra or Bunbury in Perth yeah. or in Darwin or something like that. Yeah. We're, not, we're not ready for that because mm. players would not stay there. Yeah. Um, which kind of leads to the next question. It's Bruce again. Um, where would you like the next expansion team? We were speculating on this a little in our chat before. I had a couple of suggestions. Well, Tazzy was one of them, obviously. I suggest- and then you said Papua yeah. New Guinea, didn't you? No, I was saying <laughs> Illawarra, Wollongong, possibly. Cause it's, you'd I have think- a third New South Wales team before you'd have a third WA team. I couldn't. I can't see a third team oh, fitting in Perth. Idea. I couldn't see a third team. What do you mean? Like I couldn't see enough people but, splitting from Eagles or Dockers to give a shit about. But a in New South team Wales, debate. you think they would get enough numbers from GWS? You'd City? get the location factor. You'd get all the I think Wollongong. That's very ambitious. Mm. I think. Well, isn't what? Where is Wollongong? Is it Western Sydney? No, it's it's like a few hours south. Okay. So Wollongong and Illawarra are pretty close together. Like I know they have an NBL team. That's sort of why I suggested them. Obviously, you need. A lot bigger facilities for an AFL team than an NBL. NBL, you just need a basketball court with a few thousand seats. I, AFL, you need at least a 15,000 seat footy oval at a minimum, probably more seats, really. Yeah. I firmly disagree with you that not enough WA fans will get on board. I firmly disagree with that. I think, I think you could generate it. Well, the same way that enough Dockers fans jumped on to thing is, Thing is... Have you, what Fremantle and Perth, there's always been Fremantle people. Fremantle people mm. have always had their own identity. So mm. the second the Fremantle team came in, all the people that identify as Freo sure. people in there. I don't see another location like that in Perth where people identify with that location more than a team they've yep. spent their 20 years invested in. It would need to be branded correctly. But there's enough people who watch AFL. The, yeah, the, the, the people are members. here, but what I'm saying is their loyalty. The Eagles have 90,000 members <laughs> in a 60,000 seat stadium. Is, but there were a lot, uh, including Luke Jackson is an example of this, of Eagles fans who's defected to Fremantle because they couldn't get tickets to games. Mm. And we still have that issue. For those yeah. Eagles fans that don't want to defect to Fremantle, they could pop up for this new team. I believe it's viable, 100%. What location, though? Oh, that, I feel Jundalup? like that's secondary. I don't. Yeah, maybe. It'd be Joondalup or Mantra. Yeah, but you wouldn't necessarily have to brand them as speaking specifically from there. It's like West Coast. <laughs> they can make it a just generic Perth team. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you call it. The branding is a secondary issue, but yeah. yeah. But anyway, so let's say let's assume that you needed two teams. I'd sooner say a Northern Territory. Te- uh, uh, that's actually what my other suggestion was: a Northern Territory team, but even you if you split games between Darwin and Alice. But how many players are going to? How many number one draft picks are going to stay up there? Darwin's actually a very nice place to live, believe it or not. The so wet, so beautiful Gold Coast. Yeah, and nobody stays there. <laughs> mm. I don't know. Okay, so mm. let's just. What, your opinion is. What, uh, Wollongong and Darwin? Uh, that, that, that was my suggest- I'm not saying put a team there. I'm, that was a suggestion. Like Okay. Northern Territory would probably be if I pick one. Other than- I'll say Tasmania. Yeah. I, me saying Tasmania is a given, so I didn't okay. say it. Let's okay. be realistic. Yeah, you are. I say that constantly. You do say that, to be fair to you. Yeah. It would have to be, a, uh, as much as I don't like a team being called a state, I'd probably call it Hobart. Mm. But you'd have to try and get the catchment of the whole Tassie state. Yeah. Rather than call it Tasmania Devils. I think that's shit. Mm. But anyway, that's, that, that is a branding issue. And then I reckon WA or South Australia is the next expansion point. They're, they're okay. traditional football states. Yeah, they are. I still yeah. I can't see enough people getting mined another team here. I think you overrate how committed some of these Fremantle and West Coast fans are to their team. That would, mm. I reckon they would be able to switch. Uh. There would have been a, a few Sydney fans that jumped to GWS and Brisbane fans that went to Gold Coast. A lot of Canberra people jumped on GWS because they mm. get enough Canberra games there and a lot of people move to Canberra because they get government gigs and whatnot. Like mm. people from football states who care about football move to Canberra. How much do Canberra really represent of GWS's members? I think it's a solid percentage. 
Yeah, fair enough. Anyway, we obviously disagree. I'm going to say Perth and Tasmania were the next two teams. Northern yeah. Territory and Tassie. Yeah, fair enough. I think those are awful ideas. <laughs> well, one of them is anyway. Anyway, um, man, this podcast has gone for ages, but that's all right. I'm having fun. This is yeah. good. There's only like three questions left. What are your thoughts on the academies and father-son situation? This is a really good question, so I want to answer it. But um, in, terms 2020. Of, in terms of how 2020 is a mess, this is from HK Pig slash Duck. Yeah, so what do you think about the whole system? I don't know too much about it, but it sounds like it's going to be an absolute shit show. I remember yeah. reading a while ago, they had like that exhibition game where they have the best kids from the draft that's coming up next year, like right yeah. around grand final time. They had that game. Yeah. 17 out of the 44 kids involved in that game were linked to academies or father-son. That's farcical. So a lot of the top-end talent is just going to be piss-take, bidding, bizarre, don't know how it's going to play out. So you have to just look at the system and diagnose the issue. So... I think you and I, well, I certainly feel that father-son is a great part of our game. No, I have father that to be yeah. taken That's out. a non-negotiable. If they got rid of that, people would be up in arms. Yeah. Would you change it to 50 games? Some people are discussing that. What's it currently? 100? 100, yeah. I think, I think 100 is good. 100 is good. Yeah. 100 is good. I wouldn't argue with that. Yeah. There's got to be some prestige to being a father-son. You can't just be, yeah, had a few it, kicks for him. I think, is it Noah Anderson that's played, his dad played for like 90 games for two different clubs? He yeah. doesn't qualify. I think it's Noah Anderson. Yeah, something like that. Like Hawthorne on St. Kilda mm. or something. But anyway, uh, so some will slip through the cracks. However, yeah, Father Son's great. The academy thing, what are the pros and cons? They seem to have gone overboard with them the past few years, it seems. Yeah, is that because it was more successful than they thought? Because what is or, the idea of the ta- are they actually bringing more talent to the game? I think my, my thing is I think other clubs have seen GWS and Sydney's and stuff mm. of the world that have had them in less developed football areas where they can feed and stuff mm. off a bit more. And other clubs have seen the benefit of that and they're going, hey, these guys are getting exclusive access to some yeah. of the football wells in the country. Give us a well each to dip out of. Mm. Like Freo's Academy, I think, Kalgoorlie, I'm not sure the... I think it's like guys from like yeah. Wee Bowdy, Cal sort of area we get crack at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I couldn't tell yeah. you the exact boundaries. Yeah, every team has their own boundaries. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Like, I think... What is the benefit? Are you actually attracting new talent to the game? Would a Jared Cameron or a Liam Henry be lost to not? Would they not be in the football AFL like uh, was it was scope? Would they not have a chance to play AFL if for these academies? No, they'd st- they'd yeah. be getting developed in other ways. It's just you'd think they would still yeah. play AFL, wouldn't you? Yeah. So, what is the benefit of this system other than making it a bit more even? I think it's a chance, like, they've initially, like, because, like I said, the Gold Coast, GWSC type teams, it's like, because mm. those states don't have the junior football structures in place. Mm. So I think they've sort of set up these academies for the kids who are talented enough to yeah. have an opportunity to work on those skills, not versing kids that rugby, uh, AFL is like their third preferential sport and they don't give a shit about it. Sort yeah. Of. Yeah. Like, because if you're playing in Victoria, there's enough talented kids for you to get mm. games going with the talented kids. Yeah. In those sort of states, maybe not. Yes. I, uh, yeah, it probably does give some kids an opportunity to get drafted who otherwise wouldn't. I guess there's probably a small portion because they get a discount. You basically get them for free if they're like later in the draft. Yeah. But I just, I don't know. I think it's shite, mm. to be honest, the, the academy system. I think they should all be in the open draft. I think yeah. Liam Henry should be in the open draft. Jared Cameron should have not been linked to West Coast last year. Yeah. There's other examples of that. Brando was nearly linked to GWS. As, like, I yeah. can't remember. There's some... Either he moved or the rules changed, yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, I think the boundary shrank on him. Otherwise, he yeah. was going to be GWS, but the boundary shrank like a year or two. Yeah, so I, I think that's stupid, and I think we need to get rid of it. Yeah, I probably wouldn't argue with it. Yeah. But I'll take Henry beforehand as long as no one bids on him before top 10 before they get rid of it. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be an interesting thing to see how that happens. Um, so we got a couple more questions about predictions for next year. So just we'll go through it really quick. Which team will be... Uh, I take W say which team will go up and which teams will go down next year. Ooh. Down. Ooh. Who's gotten worse? I'll say Adelaide might dip a little bit. Yeah, it could get worse there before it gets better. I think they'll play the kids and I think yeah. Brisbane will probably suffer a little bit from more injuries and more. I've said this before, but I just think they had a good run with mm. injury and fixture, which they won't get this And year. other teams will get better. Team up, Bulldogs, I'm... Well, Lock them in as a up from up. seventh, so you think they will get even better? Yeah, I think they'll not much. I think like I'm not saying they'll be a big mover up, but I think they will be finished higher than they did last year. Yeah, because they've only really figured it out midway through the year. So I think when they really started clicking as team, mm. I'll say up Hawthorne. Yep. I think they'll jump back in yep. the finals. And this is a really good question. This is the final question from Dave. 
and he asks, what do you think about the Saints hype for next season? Will they go up? They'll go up, but they're not making the eight. Yeah. I'd say I'd have them less than 50-50 make the eight at the moment, but... I'd have them about where Freo have been the past couple of years in that 13 That's kind of where they are now, isn't it? They were 14 15 you weren't they? I, oh, no, they had a like bit that. of a run towards the end, where they, yeah. Maybe they were They ended up a bit better once they had their... Yeah. Probably... I think, yeah. They had a bad injury run this year. Mighty 10 Hannibal to 13. Just, I'll call them 10 to 13. Yeah, I could see them being 9th or 10th mm. at the moment. So I do think they'll improve, but in terms of hype, I don't think yeah. they'll quite make finals. Certainly. Anyway, we're in the last minute of, uh, of the time. podcast, of the camera time, so we'll just say, we'll wrap that up. I think that was fairly good. Yeah. Some really good questions there, guys. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, this, these episodes are also available on iTunes and Spotify, so don't forget that. Well, sure, thank you for having me again. Oh, good luck. It's been real. I think the next podcast we might do is actually with the pair. Oh, nice. The YouTuber. So um, stay tuned for that and maybe a podcast series with a few other YouTubers. So thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Catches. Cheers.